Now, just to give you some perspective as to the scope of the problem, in the United States, there are about 650,000 patients annually who receive chemotherapy in an outpatient chemotherapy unit. We have about 15 and a half million cancer survivors. This represents about 4% of our global population. And that's projected to increase to about 20.3 million survivors by the age of year of 2026. Does that also, of course, incorporate those patients who survive longer now with cancer and especially the young patients we start to see more and more in our clinical practice that had cancer in their youth? Absolutely true. I mean, childhood cancer survivors are about eightfold more likely to die from cardiovascular disease, and they have about a 15-fold increased risk of expressing heart failure versus their contemporaries who didn't undergo cancer treatments. So it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem, yes. And we we'll see more and more of it as we have this aging population and more survivors of cancer, thank goodness for that. So we're going to see in our clinic, tell me this 58, 59-year-old gentleman, he has acute myeloid leukemia, no prior history of vascular disease, he has hypertension treated with amlodipine, and he's about to begin a chemotherapy-based treatment regimen. And the question for us cardiologists, what are some of the things we need to think about as we're seeing this gentleman in our clinic? And this is the concepts of surviving cancer, but at a cost. One of the most important adverse consequences to many chemotherapeutic drugs is cardiotoxicity. And this is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. And the way I see it is that the oncologist, they're the killers. You know, they want to kill cells, they want to kill the cancer cells. But we as cardiologists, we're protectors. We want to protect those normal healthy myocytes and maintain cardiac function. Because if we see cardiotoxicity, that limits the therapeutic options for our oncologists and of course has implications with respect to our patient and their long-term prognosis. So our gentleman perhaps could start with a heart that looks like this. This is the four chamber view, left ventricle, left atrium. And visually we see that there's normal left ventricular size and a normal LV function, at least by ejection fraction. But the oncologist has many arrows in their quiver that they can fire at the heart. Here we see the use of anthracyclines, monoclonal antibodies like trastuzumab, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, antimicrotubular agents, proteasome inhibitors, and all of these arrows have a potential cardiotoxic effect. So it's not only the old agents, but also the new agents that can cause cardiotoxicity. Absolutely. And now agents are being used in combination. And as we'll see, that combination may be very effective at treating the cancer, but may have synergistic effects not only on cancer, but on potential cardiotoxicity. And we'll focus our discussion on two common things, anthracyclines and, and trastuzumab. But as these arrows get fired at the heart, what you might find over time as the heart turns into something like this, the ventricle becomes dilated and there is ventricular dysfunction. And of course, this would have implications with respect to ongoing chemotherapy treatment. So I think it's important to recognize it's not just related to heart failure and LV dysfunction, that these chemotherapy agents also can cause ischemia not an exhaustive list here, but the prototypical drug would be 5-FU. They can cause hypertension, particularly with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and that might be important for our patient clinically, who we saw had treated hypertension. And so if a tyrosine kinase inhibitor was being used, we may recognize that it may become more difficult to treat their hypertension. It can affect the ECG, can cause bradycardia, it can cause QT prolongation with certain medications. And it's important to recognize this because if they're using drugs additionally that can cause QT prolongation, it would be important to recognize this. In principle, would you also see a lot of patients with ectopic beats? You might see ectopic beats, but fortunately we don't see very many sustained ventricular arrhythmias.